Kia ora, talofa, namaste, hi mai, and welcome to The Niche Cast. We are recording this on Tuesday the 13th of August, fresh after an amazing weekend of Aotearoa sport and an amazing weekend of Olympic sport that uh, flowed into an amazing weekend of Aotearoa sport. It was all there. It was all part of an exceptionally fun time to be a Kiwi who loves sport. We're from the niche-case.com, where you can read all about some Aotearoa sporting things. And if you want to dive further into Aotearoa sporting matters, you should probably sign up to our newsletter via Substack, the niche-case.substack.com, because holy guacamole, the Monday edition was absolutely jam-packed with New Zealand sporting information, much of which forms the foundations of our podcast conversation here today. So we send out our newsletter every Monday and Friday. It's just got lots of Aotearoa sporting bits and bobs. And of course, we do a big old podcast on Tuesdays. We got our deep dives on the website. We got a uh, New Zealand Warriors halves deep dive on the website. Flying Kiwis will be up as usual on Tuesday evening. Did a Stacey Walker. Um, NRL Wahine Spotlight, lots of cricket, lots of basketball, lots of rugby league, and lots of football on our website, thenews-cage.com. And if you enjoy this podcast and New Zealand sporting chit-chat, a bit of a korero, we do a bonus podcast every week on Thursdays that is only available to the generous folks on Patreon and anyone with a paid Substack subscription. Monday, Friday newsletter via Substack is completely free and there is a bonus podcast. So if you enjoy all our niche cache content, we do an extra podcast on Patreon and we send it out to the paid Substack subscribers as well. So we're doing a big podcast on Tuesday, bonus podcast on Thursday for anything else that pops up later in the week and we probably don't need to preview any Warriors games on the uh, the Thursday subscriber podcast anymore so that's all good who knows what we'll be chatting about but there's always New Zealand sporting matters to discuss quick question did you like thinking back it's, it was a while ago, so I'm just thinking back. You know, Wellington Phoenix playing their A-League Finals game at the Caketon in Wellington. Wellington Phoenix, they do rock the yellow. They're black and yellow, in fact. But I don't remember seeing any empty yellow seats for the Wellington Phoenix game in Wellington, that eight, the finals game they had in the A-League. Do you remember any empty seats there at the Caketon for the Phoenix finals appearance? The game you're talking about would be the one which was the highest attended A-League game of the entire season, I'm pretty sure, if I'm recalling that correctly. I think that would be the one. There might have been one or two empty seats hidden in the shadows somewhere, but I don't remember them. I definitely don't remember empty blocks of seats for the Wellington definitely Phoenix Finals game. So that was interesting because there were empty blocks for the All Blacks game. So, And apparently the All Blacks crowd for their loss against Argentina was bang on 25,000, which I don't think is true. Because, like, how do you get exactly 25,000? That seems like a very specific number to throw out there as your official crowd attendance. But not only did the Wellington Phoenix fill up the Wellington Stadium. 25,000 is like a couple thousand more than the Warriors get at Mount Smart Stadium. Now, the Warriors have said they've sold out the Bulldogs game at Mount Smart in a couple of weeks, which will be Sean Johnson's last game at Mount Smart Stadium. But he might not play, so it might be just like a celebration of Sean Johnson. He might not play because he might be injured, and he might not play because the Warriors might want to 
want to win. But the All Blacks got 25,000, and that's only a little bit more than the Warriors get at Mount Smart Stadium. So suddenly we have a situation, and like, so what I'm saying is that the Warriors might pass 25,000 for the last game of the season, given the occasion it's had. And I'm kind of hoping that happens because then we can say that the Warriors drew a bigger crowd. Of course, if we go back last year to their finals game against the Knights, that's bigger than 25,000. But yeah, it was 27 or something like that. Yes, but it's just, it's, it just feels a bit more compact and precise if a couple of weeks after the All Blacks get 25,000 at the Wellington Stadium and then the Warriors get around that same mark for just an NRL game at Mount Smart. Either way, Phoenix and Warriors, better tickets, bigger bigger events than an All Black test in Wellington. That's 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 pretty crazy. There there is one other um sort of common denominator between those three as well, which is that the All Blacks lost to Argentina, the Phoenix lost to Melbourne Victory, and the Warriors on current form will probably lose to, do you say the Bulldogs? They'll lose to the Bulldogs if the Bulldogs turn up. You know, they're playing for a top eight spot. Depends how hungry the Warriors are sure. against the Bulldogs. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, righto. The... Let's get a bit of mindfulness. Let's hold, go uh, mindfulness. Hold, well, you're right. hold on, I have to interrupt because I had a really good joke that came to me 10 seconds too late because the Dragons were pretty hungry against the Bulldogs and it didn't work out for them. So That's why I said hungry. <laughs> so was, we got there. We got there in the end. Okay, uh, great, yeah. Uh, mindfulness, what are you In on? that case, it was 10 seconds too late for me to catch the, catch the drift. But Yeah, that's all right. We got there in the end. Um, yeah, yeah, mindfulness. We'll, we'll try a bit of mindfulness. mindfulness. Third time. Oh, I got a bit of... <laughs> a bit of mindfulness from uh from the buddha himself um mr buds three things cannot be long hidden the sun the moon and the truth Jesus. bang on can't hide the sun can't hide the moon can't hide the truth you can't hide them for a little while mm. but not forever the sun will peek behind the clouds sometimes, uh, unfortunately, more often than we would prefer over these winter months. That's That's been common. Um, but it's coming back eventually, you know? It's done just like the truth. It'll, um, I was just thinking about how that's like the, the sun goes in cycles, right? The moon goes in cycles, the rotation of the earth and whatnot. And I guess maybe the truth goes around in cycles too. I don't know. Well, it does. But also I was thinking like sometimes the sun hides itself behind the clouds. Sometimes or every time the moon hides itself. Because when there's a new moon, you can't see the moon. Yes. So sometimes the truth hides itself for its own reason. That's... And you, you know what that kind of says to me as well as like, just chill. You know, you don't have to go fighting for the truth when you think you're right. You don't have to make a big argument. You don't have to uh, burn bridges and upset people and whatever and just be a dick about it because the truth will emerge from behind the clouds when it's ready to. You know, you don't. it's, it's actually not going to make a difference how you react to it, whether you think you're right or not. Like, you might well be right, but the truth is its own entity. That'll you know, show, its, uh, it'll show its face in due course when it needs to. After a new moon, there will be a full moon. Yeah, and the full moon is the brightest one of all. But you're shut. Before we dive into some sporting chit-chat, we have a bit of musical jam. Where we just highlight some of the music we've been listening to. A couple of hip-hop projects. We've got uh, Mark Homie and his album The Rich Ass Haitian which is pretty damn funky. Um, well, not necessarily funky compared to Jay Worthy and Damn Funk. Their project, Magic Hour, which is absolutely pure funk. But 
Yeah, it's a bad term of phrase there for Mark Hummy. Like it's it's funky as in it's cool, but it's definitely it's not quite funk music. But it's uh, just a good old high quality hip hop project. Good sounds, good messaging, bit of wisdom, bit of history lessons, bit of flow. So I enjoy listening to Mark Hummy. He's an underground legend, so he's got all sorts of. Uh, old projects that you can go back and listen to as well especially with the god fahim who's another underground legend so shout out to mark Homme and his pro and his album rich ass haitian then we also have jay worthy and damn funk the magic hour which is funky as in it's cool and it's also funky because it's funky like it's just pure west coast funk whether it's g funk whether it's funk whether it's damn funk himself it's just funky and it's very mellow, very relaxed, very West Coasty, LA, a little bit of gang banging, some um, respectful pimping stuff going on there as well. And if you want to, if you want to vibe out to a cool song, just search Jay Worthy Connected, because that will just uh, have you humming along. As well as um, the Mock Homie song. Whether it's uh, the song Rich Ass Haitian, which is a vibe, but then there's also uh, the song Sur le Pont d'Avignon, which looks like it's filmed in Haiti. Obviously, Mark Hummy is uh, he's from Haiti, got close ties to Haiti. But then that song just makes you sing along in French. So suddenly I can speak French and just uh, sing along to that tune. Most recently, though, we've had a drop from Great South. Everyone knows the Great Street, Great South. And we've got uh, the f artist formerly known as Fable. He's switched it up to Great South, and he's got the Great South EP, which is... It's kind like I don't like comparing artists. Like everyone's just got their own sound, their own vibe. But if you want to know about Great South, it's kind of like a mix between a bit of Frank Ocean and King Cruel. That's what that's what made that's what I was thinking of when I was listening to it. It dropped uh, in the last few days, the Great South EP, and it's uh, it's just good, high quality Kiwi music. He describes himself as Moldy alt rock and it's just good music great music i love it so shout out to great south one of my favorite aotearoa artists outside of the roots reggae dub realms what's your musical jam right well first off just so i'm not interrupting you while you're talking i'm just gonna shut the door because the dog barged his way in so <laughs> give me two seconds to do that There is the one and only Hamish Kerr running on the field as he celebrated his uh, his high jump gold medal. Legendary celebration, eh? Um, <laughs> that was just cool. He just he just cleared the thing and just ran off. And just it was it was legendary because like he ran off and then you just see all these camera people chasing him. But then there was also like it looked like an Olympic official, and he didn't look happy. <laughs> he was like. What are you doing? You're not meant to run over there. Like you could have got a javelin in the face or some sort of health and safety hazard. I was like, Hamish Kerr. Yeah, well, happy. the women's javelin had just been on. Like they'd just finished about ten minutes before. So maybe he knew that because um, you got downtime in between your jumps. You're probably picking around. You got to be aware because they're walking back and forth across the track. So there's people constantly telling them, "Don't go now. There's a race on or whatever." So maybe. Um, but I also met he could easily have just been running off in the pure emotion of the moments and not thought about that. So yeah, I can understand that. Um, I, I can understand that for sure. Uh, the, the, timely to have a song as well. You're saying um, to sing along in French after the Olympics because yeah, it was a bit of that. Was, they kept playing that one song that was like dun, 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 dun. Um, yeah, that. Banger. I don't know what the words are. Yeah. yeah, that banger. I don't know what the words are because it was in French, but I I just heard it everywhere they everywhere they went, and the crowd kept singing along because obviously a lot of French people in the crowd because it was the French Olympics. I will um, push back a little bit because of the history between France and Haiti. I'm not sure it's like necessarily there is some yeah, yeah something we want to celebrate there, but 
night. Yeah, I understand the French connection. Yeah, when they were talking about at times about like the um, which it was of like very cool to have the surfing in Tahiti in a French colony, but then also I'm like, well, they've it's a good thing they didn't have it in North and in, uh, in New Caledonia because you know there's very very real tensions going on there over the last few months. Uh, as for as for musical tunes. What have I got here that I've been listening to lately? There was a new OC's album, which is awesome because every OC's album is awesome. And this one is absolutely like, it, it sounds like chonky guitar riffs the whole way through, but there's actually like no guitar on it at all. They've just distorted saxophone to make it sound like guitar, which they didn't even have a saxophone in that band. So they've, I don't know, they brought in a specialist or something. It's pretty wild how they... I just just John Dwyer in particular, the main man of that band, is just relentlessly creative. Um, what else have we got here? Quite liked Biba Doobie, um, English songwriter, Cassandra Jenkins, a little bit more uh sort of synthy uh sounds there from her. Wand have a new album, which is a bit more sort of um they're kind of a psychedelic band, but they're this one is a little more like jazzy um just them jamming in the studio basically and cutting things down to size to make something fit there's a charlie crockett album which was very cool but above all else uh sturgill simpson put out a new record and he did it well he didn't he did it because it's not technically sturgill simpson because he's he's been away for a couple years he had this injury like a vocal cord injury where he couldn't sing for like a year or two and he was sick of touring and um sick of the music business and all this kind of thing and he'd, o he'd often said he would make five albums under his own name and then just retire which is showing you know his antsiness was there from from day one and he did that but then also during the pandemic he made two more albums but they weren't original albums they were just cover albums of his old songs but just done in a in a different style like done does to be like bluegrass country tunes with um remix you know accused remixed yeah remixed in a way remixed in kind of the opposite way to what people normally mean when they say that but still in a truthful way um the, you can't you can't hide the truth for long so so what he's done is he's come up with a sneaky little um he's come up with a what, what would you call it like a little bit of a bait and switch there where he's put out a new album but he's put it out under a different name he's now calling himself johnny blue skies um which is apparently just an old uh, he's explained where he got the name from it was like some guy in a bar he used to play in when he was just starting out he'd turn up and this guy this old drunk at the bar would be like oh here comes johnny blue skies again which i guess is like an ironic this dude singing sad songs but you know we'll give him a happy name um which i guess stuck and it's not no one really takes the johnny blue skies thing seriously but if it's artistically freeing for him to be able to say like um you know, just uh, in a because in a way the album just feel it's no different than anything else he's done. It's just maybe better, like maybe a little bit stronger, maybe a little bit freer. Uh, whatever works, basically. So um, do you, you let the creative sorts come up with whatever solutions they can find to get to the best stuff? And this has worked for Sturge because I've listened to this thing more than any other album I've heard all year. It is fantastic. And it is probably the best thing I've heard all oh, year. I, I love it. it the, in fact, you know what? It even has a French name. Um, one of the songs was written while he was hanging out in France, just getting away from it all. Uh, Passage du Dessert. Which I don't know what that means, but um, it has a French title. So we're staying on theme even with that. Sturgill Simpson slash Johnny Blue Skies. Let's stay in France where we had a extremely fun couple of days at the olympics to finish the olympics you are across all the like track and field lisa carrington all sorts of gold medal stuff there so you can dive into that in a jiffy i cover lydia co and lydia co won a gold medal at the olympics and this is her third medal in three olympics I, I I get how awesome the full set idea is. She got a silver, bronze, then a gold. But I don't like the biggest thing for me is that she is still the only golfer ever in the history of the world 
to win multiple Olympic medals. And that happened before the Paris Olympics. So that was already awesome. Now she's won three consecutive medals, regardless of the color. Regardless of the color, she was the only golfer to win two medals in the history of golf at the Olympics. Now she's got three. So no other golfer, man or woman, no other human has two medals in golf at the Olympics, let alone three. And that's where Lydia Coe's sitting. And this was on, the, on my mind. I've, I'll, I pointed this out after she won the bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympics. But that was kind of focusing on 2006 at Rio, then 2020, 2021 in Tokyo. But apparently golf was played in the 1900 Olympics and the 1904 Olympics for men. Women were only graced with the opportunity to play in the 1900 Olympics. So including, and then golf took a big break from the Olympics for whatever reason. Including those three events, the two events early in the 1900s for men and the 1900 event for women. Including those events, no human has won multiple medals in golf in the Olympics. And the only thing more impressive than three different medals in golf at the Olympics would be if a like female or a male won a medal in like 1900 and then won another medal in 2016. That's the only thing that can top Lydia Ko because that would be absolutely ridiculous, obviously. But now Lydia Ko is, she's just blasted herself into the, like, the realms of the greatest, New Zealand's greatest Olympians, to be honest. And the interesting thing here is that I don't care at all about the LPGA Tour. I've tracked Lydia Ko on the LPGA Tour for a couple of years, a few years. Not every year, because... Lydia Ko often has bad years on the LPGA Tour, including last year, including this year. Like these are her two worst years leading into an Olympics and in an Olympic year. But she had her best result at the Olympics. So Lydia Ko on the LPGA Tour, she's had some great years, mainly when she was younger. She had some adversity. She's had some good years, bad years in recent history. But now she's got a gold medal. So the weird thing here with Lydia Ko and some of the, uh, like Lisa Carrington, Hamish Kerr, I'm missing some athletes. Forgive me, you'll touch on them in a jiffy. They, like for a lot of these sports, their focus is the Olympics. They don't necessarily have a professional competition outside the Olympics that is a, like a, a pure professional outlet for these uh, athletes. Lydia Ko, like to me, her feats in the Olympics are bigger and better than her career on the LPGA Tour. And the gold medal at the Paris Olympics sealed this. And it's it's put Lydia Ko in this kind of category where I don't care what else she does on the LPGA Tour and the rest of her career. She reckons she's going to retire from the Olympics and just keep playing LPGA Tour maybe. She should chill out on the LPGA Tour, play the events she needs to, and keep pursuing Olympics. Like That's what she should really do. But... Yeah, this, this result, it just put Lydia Ko in a space where she is a great Olympian, not just a great golfer. She's a great golfer. She's done great things on the LPGA Tour. But her biggest achievement, I believe, is three consecutive medals, one of each color in the Olympics. And it's a strange, like... Maybe like the sevens, they've got a seven circuit adjacent to the Olympics. 
basketball there's the nba adjacent to the olympics track and field they've got world cups and stuff like that but they don't necessarily have a professional league adjacent to the olympics lydia co there's, there's diamond league but it's not you know that takes second fiddle yeah. by a long way to the olympics yeah right Lydia Coe's got the LPGA Tour, and she's very good on the LPGA Tour, but her best result at the Olympics came when she's having a tough period on the LPGA Tour. And it's just, it's fascinating diving into the nuance of golf and then just coming out of it and being, well, Lydia Coe's just a great Olympian outside of the golf stuff. You can touch on Lydia Ko or you can take us into the other exceptional, awesome, funky doo doo Aotearoa feats to finish the Olympics. Well, three medals and three different Olympics, obviously unprecedented as a goal for. I'm guessing there's not too many New Zealanders full stop who have done that, like, which is what, which is what you're saying. This is not just great Olympic golfer, that's great Olympian full stop um because i did look up how like how many other people have got three medals for new zealand at the olympics and there's actually like you know there's 20 plus people or something like that it's a fairly long list it's not that i mean lisa carrington's up to like eight or nine or so, I, I think i think eight golds and nine medals overall i think for her so th there's a few like that um but like that's because she can turn up and get three medals every event Lydia Ko has one medal on offer. You know, you can you can place once in the one golf tournament that they have per Olympics, which has conveniently spanned her career. Like before her career, there was no golf at the Olympics for 110 years or something. And then she gets gone and then the Olympics comes back straight away. Uh, that's that's a, a nice bit of timing. There are golfers 10 years older than her who miss out on that, you know? I don't... Like, it's very weird to, like, say someone's destiny, someone else's destiny is this. But what you're saying there, I'm like, Lydia Ko's career seems destined to be a great Olympian. Because she entered the LPGA Tour so young that by the time golf started in 2016 or golf returned in 2016, shout out to the 1900 uh, golf tournament. By the time golf returned to the Olympics in 2016, Lydia Ko was already like just a solid professional at a very young age. At age 19 when she won her first yeah. medal. And she'd already been on the tour for like three years or something. So and had the, won a major by then. Exactly. So it's like Lydia Ko, for this to happen, Lydia Ko had to enter the LPGA Tour at such a young age. She had to go through winning and adversity, so she was ready by the time that the 2016 Olympics rolled around to do what she does best. So it kind of feels like Lydia Ko, she wasn't a, like destined to be a great golfer. Everything about her career was destined to be a great Olympian. Because the prime years of her career, and it seems like she is going to retire relatively young for athletes, her career was kind of designed in a lab for pure Olympic success. Because her prime years of her young career covered the span of the of golf at the Olympics. That's that's what makes it so cool with the golf context. Yeah, I wonder I wonder how many um how many New Zealand Olympians have won medals at three different events cuz I mentioned Carrington is someone who's got a lot more medals but that's she has medaled at three Olympics I'm pretty sure it might even be four. Um not sure. I know Valerie Adams did at least three, probably four, so um not unprecedented by any means for, for Lydia Ko, but just pretty incredible, especially because as well, like if you're Valerie Adams, which is not to diminish the the absolute excellence of her career, but like she went into a lot of those Olympics knowing she was the best. And if she does her best, she will win. Golf is so volatile. 
Like you're four rounds and one hole could like spoil the whole thing. There was the the Swiss girl that was on the same um, tea time as uh, as Lydia Ko, who on the last day like went in tied with her on the last day, and she had like a three over shot early on and was just never in contention after that. It's like the whole week is just spoiled because you hit one into the rough and couldn't get it out. You know, like that's that's kind of the nature of of golf in a way and it, it is one reason why Lydia Ko hasn't just won consistent events over and over is because no one wins consistent events over and over because it's really hard to do that because there's so many factors and so many like talented golfers and the difference between the best golfer in a tournament and like the 30th best golfer in a tournament is not that much because that 30th one could just turn up and win and so to be able to have that level of consistency in the Olympics like that is absolutely incredible three tournaments in a row and she topped it off with a gold in the third one it's crazy to your point lydia ko's scoring average was 61st last year and it's 22nd this year going back for a previous olympics she's been top six for scoring average the year before and the year of the olympics now She's not top six. She's not even top 20, but she won an Olympic gold medal. We touched on Lisa Carrington. You've got an interesting note here in our newsletter via Substack, the newscase.substack.com. Eight out of 10 Kiwi gold medals were won by female athletes and or teams, which is pretty cool for our Tiaroa. And you also said that uh, thanks to Hamish Kerr and Maddie Weish, New Zealand has taken multiple athletics medals from three Olympics in a row and has at least one medal in every event going back to 2008. I assume you're meaning just one medal in every track and field event, across every track and field event. And we've got another nugget here from our newsletter. The list of gold medals in athletics for New Zealand. Which is a pretty long list for a country as small as New Zealand. We've got 11 gold medals and Hamish Kerr is the latest. He won the high jump gold medal, which comes after Valerie Adams, uh, two gold medals. We've got John Walker, Peter Snell, Peter Snell, Murray Halberg, Peter Snell, Norman Reed, Yvette Williams and Jack Lovelock. There's a bit of a transition there because there's a lot of uh, running. Shout out to Norman Reed, the walking Don. He got a gold medal for walking. Yvette Williams, long jump. But then we go to, so you got the track, then you got the field. Valerie Adams in the shot put and Hamish Kerr in the high jump. And also, of course, we had Maddie Weish winning a silver, I believe, in the women's shot put. Take us where you want to go with uh, the rest of the gold medal excellence or meddling excellence especially in the track and field because you pre-olympics i think you were saying this is the biggest athletics team or something like that yeah i think it was they advertised it as such anyway um which is pretty cool you, you want to be able to qualify more and more athletes like there's that aspect to it is like how many can you get there and then there's the subsequent one which is how many of them can get onto the podium and yeah since 2008 we've had at least one athletics competitor medal every single time the last three in a row we've had multiple and looking at that like that list you read out there which goes all the way back to um was jack lovelock the the earliest one that's 1936 yeah so nearly 100 years of like <laughs> nine, 90 odd years of um of history there tracking back there uh, to that's spread out over a long distance is what I'm saying. And there was, I think, a because um, we used to have a lot of runners. You mentioned a lot of it, like Lovelock was a runner. Peter Snell was a runner, um, John Walker. And then after John Walker's gold in 76, I think there was only one New Zealand athlete, like athletics athlete, to medal up until Valerie Adams broke the streak in 2008. So there was a 32-year span where we had one, and it was a, I um, can't remember who it was. Is it written in there? It was a women's marathon runner in the in the 90s, got a medal. Um, I can't find it quickly, so. Yeah, well, I, 
I have it written down here. Anyway, oh, Lorraine, um, Lorraine Muller. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the one. So she was the only one for like 32 years. And now, with, you know, we're 16 years beyond that 32-year drought. But since that drought broke, that's what, um, 8, 12, 16, 20, slash 21, 24. So that's five Olympics since then where we have medaled at least once every time. And a couple of times in the last few, that's pretty crazy. And it, like Matty Wishy and Hamish Kerr are not like Tom Walsh or or Valerie Adams who had medaled before, turning up and medaling again. They were new medalists at this level, which is, yeah, pretty incredible. Um, things broke nicely for both of them in, in their own ways, but that's how the Olympic Games work, because if you don't turn up on the day, it doesn't matter how well you qualified or how well, you, um, how well you've been going throughout the season, it's... It's just, it's a one off event, and um, the two the two previous high jump champs who shared the medal last time, but this time they didn't share the medal. They went to a, a jump off, which it was kind of a cool, um, you know, viral moment in Tokyo when they did do that thing where they shared it. They agreed to share it. There was a big hug, and the Italian guy runs off celebrating. The Qatari guy runs off celebrating. But it's better this way, isn't it? Like, is there anything you'd rather get like an actual winner rather than having two people sharing when you could have kept going to find a like that's how the Olympics are supposed to work? And a silver medal is nothing to be ashamed of. Like, a silver medal is a crowning achievement for pretty much everyone. So, um, and I think both those two guys took that in the right spirits as well, even though it was kind of weirdly like a lot of Americans were getting frisky about it because they thought the American guy just rejected it and was like, no, nah, no, nah, we're going for it. And then he lost. And then they were getting all upset about whether they would finish ahead of China on the overall standings or not, which is their problem, not ours. But it seemed like Hamish Kerr basically said, no, nah, we just looked at each other and was like, yeah, let's do a jump off. Like, let's, let's finish this thing properly. So I don't think there was any... Um, disagreement or anything like that they were both keen on on whatnot and both like kurt equaled his personal best to get to the the highest height they got to and the other fellow shelby McEwen, the american jumper broke his personal best so they were both at the absolute limits of their capabilities to to get where they got to so there's no again like these are crowning achievements there's no shame either way if hamish kurt had finished with silver it would still have felt this you know it still would have been uh, the the best thing he's ever done in high jump, you know? Um, and, but as it is, he got a gold and he got to run off uh, celebrating. And Maddie wish she was unlucky because she also threw, she didn't just throw a personal best, she smashed her personal best. She beat it by a fairly decent, like a 10 or 12 centimeter margin or something like that. But then got pipped by the German thrower in the final throw, which is one of those, again, it's like, that's the that's the flip side of if Kerr had finished silver. That's what that looks like is for Maddie Wishy, who was leading for a lot of the way, but then someone just threw further. And if you've thrown the best you've ever thrown and someone else was better, you just, you doff your cap, you know? You, you say, congratulations, you beat me. I could not have, I could not have um, competed with that, but I beat everyone else in the field and I'm going to be pretty bloody proud about my silver medals. So, yeah, cool stuff from there. I thought there was maybe a chance, like Geordie Beamish and Sam Stammer had been in really good form coming into this and went in some some events and, and stuff and some of the running stuff. But then that just shows you how, um, again, this is why like the Diamond League is awesome. There's World Indoor Champs and stuff like that. These are great. But then in an Olympic year, the Olympics takes precedent over everything else. And there are guys who don't compete at those because they're prioritizing the Olympics. You know, so-and-so is not going to risk an injury or such and such isn't going to travel there because they're in camp somewhere else or or whatever. These things can be misleading. So the the running team didn't do a whole lot. Um, although I do think getting uh, Zoe Hobbs to a semifinal was pretty cool, like of the women's 100-meter sprint. Like We hadn't even had a women's 100-meter sprint to qualify for, the, for an entire Olympic event for a very long time and to get someone into this like through her first seat and the the first seat that she ran as well the the one the, the woman who finished ahead of her she was second and the woman who finished first was julian alfred who went on to win so in her heat she was beaten by the, the olympic champion that's also a pretty cool story to to take from that so yeah biggest ever athletics team and outstanding work across the board but outstanding outstanding work across the board in so many ways which is the think is the like because i you know <laughs> We had the medal angst stuff at the start where people were wondering, if, like, why have we gone five days? We haven't won a medal. Was gonna, yeah, well, they don't give away a lot of medals in the first few days. And it's also about the events, like a lot of swimming up front. We're not great at swimming. Although I will say Erica Fairweather 
made the final of all three events that she entered, which that's not a medal, but that's pretty crazy too. That's a pretty, that's a hell of an achievement in its own, including finishing fourth in, in one of them, which was like, Again, fourth is gutting because you're that close to a medal, but it was one of the fastest races in history in that, I think, was it 200 butterflies? Something like that, I can't remember. No shame in that when you're beaten by the best in the business, you know, the best that there's ever been. It's, there's no dramas there. And you get, like, I looked it up to what it was like last time when we got to 20 medals, and it was a very similar thing. It's like, you know, our big medal halls didn't start coming in until the rowing and stuff started, and then the canoeing, and then actually we didn't do a lot in cycling last time. I think we only had about tw two medals in cycling last time. We had five, I think, this time around. Bunch in the rowing, a few in the canoe. Like, there's the sports that we excel at, we excelled at again. And then also, like, how many other nations are getting track and field medals and multiple canoeing medals and rowing medals and cycling medals like we're we're doing it in the um in the in the field we're doing like we're doing we're winning medals on foot we're winning medals on wheels we're winning winning medals with um on the water you know there's the the variety of um because i used the example in the in the newsletter about uzbekistan who were fi who finished like just behind us or something like that and um, or near, near enough us on the table, which it turns out if uh, Uzbekistan has like 35 million people or something. So a way bigger country, even though you don't hear about them a lot in sports. They won 13 medals. One was for weightlifting, so being a strong bugger. The other 12 were all for various versions of combat sports. You know, five gold medals in boxing, a bunch in, in judo and taekwondo and wrestling and all this kind of thing. Like, don't pick a scrap with an Uzbeki, but like, they didn't win one in rugby. They didn't win anything in athletics. They're not winning on the bike and on the water. You know, the just the the array, the vastness of different um, sports that the New Zealand Olympic team was able to achieve in is insane. Even before you get into the ones who like didn't medal but did pretty cool things, like Erica Fairweather and swimming, which is a completely different sport to this. Like, there's a different variety of sports to these other ones that were mentioned as well. So, incredible! Like this, this was our best ever Olympics. Like to to underline it to, to summarize that whole experience this was our best ever olympics 10 gold medals most ever and then equal our most total medals of 20 and for half of those 20 to be gold is it's insane stuff and you just look at the you look at the um the the lists of nations in and around us in the top 20 or the top 15 certainly and it's just like massive country massive country massive country or with big economies big like sporting structures and programs and all this money to throw at stuff sponsorship professional leagues all this stuff and then there's a small island nation with five and a half million people that's up there with most of them you know this is incredible stuff and this is why we are always saying that Aotearoa is the best sporting nation on the planet because we can do that to your point the top 15 for olympic medals Hungary is the only country listed here with less than 17 million people. They've got 9 million. New Zealand's got 5 million. So that puts into context. That's, that's still nearly double us. Exactly. That is why New Zealand is the best sporting nation in the world. One of the gold medals at the Olympics was won on the 31st of July. That was when the women's, well, that's when the Blackfern Sevens won their gold medal, 31st of July. Part of the awesome Sunday or weekend was that on the 11th of August, less than two weeks after they won their gold medal, Stacey Walker and Tyler King lined up in the NRLW. Neither the Broncos who Stacey Walker played for, or the Dragons, who Tyler King played for, had won a game. They were 0-2 to start the NRLW. Then Stacey Walker appears for the Broncos, and Tyler King appears for the Dragons. They win. So they won an NRLW game less than two weeks after winning a gold medal in sevens rugby. That is just as crazy as any of the gold medal stuff that was happening that weekend. And watching the Broncos win, 
over the Gold Coast Titans. Like I was spending more time watching the, the Stacey Walker and Gail Broughton and Mali Hufunga, Tafito Lafaele, Lavinia Gould. I was spending more time watching them than I was watching the Warriors because the the Broncos game started at 3.45, Warriors started at 4 o'clock. I wasn't switching away from that Broncos game because it was so fun to watch. And it's worth noting, it wasn't just Stacey Walker's first game. So it was Gail Broughton's first game of the season. It was Tafito Lafaele, her first game of the season. Now, what do all these players have in common? Shout out Jasmine Fogavini, because she played for the Kiwi Ferns last year. But she's the outlier here because she didn't play rugby union in Aotearoa. Stacey Walker, Gail Broughton, and Lavinia Gould. Lavinia Gould is like 40 years old, 41 years old, and apparently she made her debut in Sevens Rugby at 17 years old. Those three all played Sevens Rugby for New Zealand. Mele Hufunga played Super Rugby, but at this point I'm fairly confident in saying that Mele Hufunga was too good for the Black Ferns. Tafito Lafaele did play for the Black Ferns prior to joining NRLW. So Stacey Walker, Gail Broughton, Mele Hufunga, Tafito Lafaele, Lavinia Gould, that's five out of the six Broncos who played on Sunday had played Super Rugby or higher in Aotearoa. That tells you all you need to know about the battle between NRLW and women's rugby in Aotearoa. And to, to be honest, given what we saw with the All Blacks, tells you all you need to know about the battle between rugby league and rugby union. Stacey Walker, she made her debut on the wing for the Broncos. She was pretty impressive. Her speed, footwork and power translates nicely to playing on the wing in the NRLW. It was quite funny, though, because like every play the ball was very deliberate. She made, for, she made sure that she put her, the ball down and rolled the ball back with her foot. Like you watch Nelson Asafa Solomona play the footy. His foot is nowhere near the ball, and that's, that is making the most out of the, uh, the referee's discretion. Like everyone's looking for a small advantage. A lot of players don't necessarily touch the football with their foot. And that's all good because it's just, you know, players are making the most of the discretion from the referee. Stacey Walker, her first game of rugby league, very cautious in playing the footy. So that was, uh, that was fun to watch because it was like, no one else is doing that, but I understand why you're being cautious playing the footy because it is obviously the biggest difference between the codes. Uh, Stacey Walker was awesome. Uh, but the Broncos won that game 44-4 to against the Gold Coast Titans. Georgia Hale made a bunch of tackles, as she always does. It was a tough uh, result for the, the uh, NRL Wahine Titans. I think Niall Williams Guthrie suffered an early injury, so that didn't help either. Stacey Walker did have a line break. She did have some very uh, powerful, dynamic carries on the wing. But Mele Hufunga scored four tries. And Mele Hufunga scored four tries, I think it was for the second time in her career, because she did so last season. I think it was also round three last season she scored four tries. So she's got some weird synchronicity there. But Mele Hufunga scored her tries on the left edge. Stacey Walker was playing on the right wing. And Gail Broughton, her first game of the season, she was playing on the left side of the field in the halves as well. So it was quite interesting. The Broncos didn't necessarily roll out attacking shapes for Stacey Walker. Because she's in her first game, they'll build into it. It'll be interesting to see her, her combination with Ali Brigginshaw, who's the halfback on the right edge for the Broncos. She does a lot of the kicking. So I'll be, I'm really interested to see how the Broncos um, get Stacey Walker and develop her as a right winger. But it was the Broncos' left edge that was tearing the Titans apart. Hufunga scored four tries. Gail Broughton was awesome in the halves. Really like what I saw from her. But something else happened. I think it might have been on Sunday as well. 
let me confirm this because this would be a bit pretty crazy this would be the sea eagles yes sunday Mali Hofunga went to Southern Cross Campus, which is in Mangari, in Auckland. She scored four tries on Sunday. Also on Sunday, we had Lavinia Tau Halaliku, who is playing for the Sea Eagles, one of many young Auckland wahine who are playing for the Sea Eagles in the New South Wales Women's Premiership. Like, half the team is from Auckland. Because I think there's a connection between the Sea Eagles and Auckland Rugby League. She scored five tries. What school did she go to? Southern Cross Campus. So between Malehofunga and Lavinia Tauhalaliku, they combined to score nine tries on one day. Hufonga did so in the NRLW, and Tao Halaliku did so in the New South Wales Women's Premiership. Nine tries, two players, I think, he, ooh, they were both playing left centre. How about that? That's crazy. So the Broncos had a good win with all their... Uh, I'm calling them the Black Fern Broncos. Bit of a giggle. Um, but they had a good win. Shout out to them. Tyler King, she played Sunday night for the Dragons. And this was interesting because Tyler King came off the bench. She was a late call-up. She was on the extended bench. Then she was a late call-up to the bench. So they were just easing her back in. She came on in the 21st minute when the Dragons were down 10-0. Knights scored two tries. Dragons didn't score any tries. With Tyler King on the field, Dragons scored four tries. Knights scored no tries. And the Dragons won 18-10. So that's the impact of Tyler King. She played... She basically came off the bench to play in the halves. She didn't, like, she wasn't overly busy. She made her tackles, had a few runs, um, shifted the footy pretty nicely. But the Dragons hadn't won a game. Like the Broncos, they didn't win their, they lost their first two games. And then Tyler King's in the team, in the squad. She's on the bench, and the Dragons are losing. So for two and a bit games, the Dragons are losing. Then Tyler King enters the game, Dragons start winning. How about that? Straight off a gold medal. Beautiful stuff. The Dragons also had Ma'a Tuleo Fotomawala on the wing. They got Racine McGregor in the halves with Tyler King. Angelina Tiakaranga Katoa. She was starting a prop. She's awesome. She's a Kiwi Ferns international. Alexis Tawenii, she's, if she's not one of the best forwards in the NRLW, she's behind Georgia Hale, but that's all right because Tawenii is 19 years old. And she plays 70 minutes every game at lock for the Dragons. She makes over 20 tackles. She's got over 140 meters. Like she just dominates as a 19 year old. And then we've got Tyler King. So the Dragons, they're full of Kiwi Wahine as well. Kiwi Fern Internationals, as well as the Broncos. Um, so the shout out to them. They had their first wins with the gold medal flavor of the Stacey Walker and Tyler King duos. But there's a lot of Kiwi Wahine in those teams, as well as the Black Fern Sevens players returning from the Olympics. And we also had like the Sharks. They're 3-0. They're the only undefeated team in NRLW. And they have... They got Brooke Anderson, who's a Kiwi Fern International, but I think she's born and raised in Australia. And they've also got Anessa Biddle. The one and only Anessa Biddle 
Otara Scorpion Jr. She just had another epic game at center. She scored a try 15 runs for 197 meters. 13 meters per run. And she is first for post-contact meters. So Anessa Biddle is absolutely dominating in her second season. Same with uh, Tauenei. Same with all the rugby union converts. Who are moving from Black Ferns and Black Ferns 7. So great stuff happening in the NRLW. And it's, uh, it's just such a fun competition with the quantity and quality of ladies from Aotearoa who are taken over. And it's, uh, it's kind of mind-boggling because it's not getting any smaller. <laughs> like there's, I'm finding out about a new youngster from Aotearoa playing in the New South Wales Women Premiership every single week. And all of this is happening before the Warriors return to NRLW. Speaking of the Warriors, they had a loss to the Dolphins. Like, to me, there's one thing I can sum up this, uh, this performance and where the Warriors are at. The Warriors had Jermaine Isako. They'd win a lot more games than they have this season. Not only is Jermaine Isako just a straight-up better winger than Ed Kosi or Marcelo Montoya. He's a better goal kicker than anyone at the Warriors, and he's a better drop goal kicker than anyone at the Warriors. So you're not only having a better winger, but with Jermaine Isako, you've got someone who is going to kick the conversions, and you've got, some, you've got a clutch player right there. Someone who can kick two-point drop goals. Who's kicking a two-point drop goal for the Warriors? No one. Who's, Who's kicking, kicking a... any field goal for the Warriors? <laughs> Who's kicking a droppy for the Warriors? No one. So I think if the Warriors had Jermaine Isako, they would have won a lot more games this season. It's just a losing vibe for the Warriors. Never really thought they were going to win that game against the Dolphins, even though like, the Warriors throughout the season have done well to be in those contests. Like they're... They lose, and they find ways to lose. As we've said all season, they don't earn the... Uh, they don't earn the advantage of the referees. The, re the referees make a lot of strange calls against the Warriors, but that's because the Warriors are losing the collision. They're doing losing things. They're losing the game. They're losing the flow of the game. And you're never going to have a referee blow in your favor if you're doing losing things. So it's, yeah, like many Warriors fans, I'm watching the game like, that doesn't make sense. That's another rough call against the Warriors. But then you sit back and you're like, well, they're not really doing anything to alter the perception of the referee. This is a very airy theory thing. But losing teams have the referee blow against them. It's just that simple. And the Warriors are a losing team. They don't know how to win. And it's, uh, I'm still fascinated by how the end of the season plays out. Because things could get very awkward in a variety of different ways. But the thing about the Warriors is that they're fourth in New South Wales Cup. And they finished second. Wait, let me skip through to the end of the season. They finished third in New South Wales Cup last season. In both seasons, they've had a young New South Wales Cup team. And the Warriors New South Wales Cup team had a 28 to 10 win over the Rabbitohs. Nine of the 17 players are under 21s. So that's over half of the team are under 21s. And for the second season in a row, they're one of the four best teams in New South Wales Cup. There's a pretty crazy try from Toby Crosby, who's from Greytown, went to St. Pat Silverstream. You can check out Toby Crosby's highlights for St. Pat Silverstream first 15. Crazy highlights. The craziest rugby union highlights you'll see. 
you can check in with his jersey flag highlights and they're some of the craziest highlights you ever see like the, the, this dude scores ridiculous tries and he's just in the jersey flag team like there's a new south wales cup team with half of the team as under 21 lads who are ahead of toby crosby Let me look at the Warriors forward pack. So Toby Crosby, he's starting prop for the Jersey flag team. I'm, I think I read somewhere that Tanner Stella Smith, how old is he? He's 20 years old. He's starting prop. So Tanner Stella Smith and Zion Maiu, they're starting props in New South Wales Cup. They could be playing Jersey flag alongside Toby Crosby. Jacob Laban, he's edge forward. He's under 21s. Could be playing New Jersey Fleg. Leka Halasima. He's 18 years old. Playing New South Wales Cup. Could have been playing SG Ball under 19s. Harry Durbin. Big bopper from Rotorua. He's under 21s. He came off the bench for New South Wales Cup. Even Makaya Tafua, who is from Christchurch. He plays as a hooker, but he's he's done a little bit of lock forward. Eddie Eremia. He could be playing Jersey Flag. What have we said about Eddie Eremia all season? He's playing prop. He's playing edge forward. He's playing center. He scored two tries at center for the Warriors. That's just the forwards. All those dudes are forwards who could be playing Jersey Flag. But they're playing New South Wales Cup. I love Toby Crosby, right? Like, <laughs> anyone who watches those highlights, you'll be like, wowza. This dude's crazy. Let me check in with the Jersey Flag uh, forward pack. Because there's some other good forwards there. Like Rodney Tui Palotovea. He's from SG Ball. He's the other starting prop in the Jersey Flag team. So he's younger than Toby Crosby. But he's playing in the same team as Toby Crosby. Ben Penny's a big bopper. He's off the bench. Presley Siomanu Tingafua. Very powerful uh, forward. Power Papuni Abbott. He's a big bopper from Auckland as well who didn't even make that Jersey flag top 17 team that won against the Rabbitohs. My point here is that you go watch Toby Crosby's highlights. They are ridiculous. But every forward in the New South Wales Cup team is also under 21. Well, not every forward, but the majority of the forwards in the New South Wales Cup team are also under 21s, but they're playing a level higher than Toby Crosby. Zion Maiu, Jacob Laban, Leka Halasima, they've already played NRL. But they're also under 21s, like Toby Crosby. Eddie Irami is playing centre, edge forward, and prop in New South Wales Cup. Cup. And he's in the same under-21 bracket as Toby Crosby. Toby Crosby's starting prop partner is an SG ball player. To me, this is this is what this is the most important thing about the Warriors right now. Because the NRL team's stinky. They're losing. They're losers. Dimitri Sifakula, he had a nice little game coming off the bench for the Warriors against the Dolphins. He might be... Uh, might have to look this up. Let's let's see if uh, Dimitri Sifakula... Let's check in with his age. Because he might be Jersey Flag as well. Dimitri Sifakula is 20 years old. So he is eligible for the same team as... Toby Crosby, but he's playing NRL. Most important thing for Warriors fans. The system's pretty damn good. The New South Wales Cup team are a winning team for the second season in a row, full of youngsters. You'll be seeing the Toby Crosby highlights. I love them. I love Toby Crosby. It's epic. He's epic. He's awesome. Craziest shit I've ever seen. But there's dudes who are younger than him 
who are ahead of him. His peers in the Jersey Fleet team are younger than him. This is, this is the amount of talent and the quality of talent that the Warriors are working with. There's, there's a lot of bad vibes in the NRL team. But if we're like, there's a lot of chat, you know, Stephen Crichton, what's his impact on the Bulldogs? He's such a leader. Jerome Luai, he's going to be such an influential figure at the Tigers. Well, James Fisher Harris is joining the Warriors and he's the captain of the Aotearoa Kiwis. Apparently, according to someone last year, James Fisher Harris has the mana of many men. He's going to have a similar impact on the Warriors as Stephen Crichton and or Jerome Luai. So that's all happening, but the Warriors' talent, again, the quantity, the quality, is above average. And that's me being conservative. It is above average. Right now, Toby Crosby deserves all your attention. But also, you should be aware that he is just one name on a high-quality list of youngsters in the forwards because Motu Pasikala he's playing New South Wales Cup after starting an SG ball the Warriors signed Jet Cleary but they've already got Luke Hansen playing New South Wales Cup footy from the Panthers he's Jersey flag C.O. Kelly started an SG ball he's a high quality outside back there's like, this is not a time to be down or negative about the talent the Warriors have coming through because there's so much more talent outside of the epic headline highlight reel Toby Crosby. I wasn't prepared for that to be such a energetic rant, but it was. So that it is what it is. Well, do any of those, um, do any of the young dudes kick field goals and uh make conversions well the uh the tongan football international motu pasikala kicks goals oh there you go it's a bit of pedigree there but he didn't even um, do the uh kicking for the new south wales cup luke metcalf was doing the kicking for new south wales cup so in that team taint to our picky wasn't playing he's a goal kicker so you got like three goal kickers right there in the new south wales cup team as the NRL team struggles to score points with the boot, they um I didn't I didn't pay full attention to the Warriors game because there was other stuff going on at the same time. But so Jermaine Sacco hit like twenty five kicks in a row or something like that. Is that what was that? What was the thing they were trying to say? He's like on a massive streak of just making conversions and penalty goals and what. Yeah, I'm not sure, but he's a great kicker. He's absolutely a great kicker. That's like, that's one of the, that's like, that's a streak like that goes beyond just like, you're the best kicker on your team to you're one of the very few best kickers in the entire competition. And he nailed the hell out of that field. Um, there's, he, he missed the field goal, I think, but he, he booted it from like, um, because it was what's his name hit the left DA and and golden points the one that actually won it, but Asako had that one attempt at the end of regular time I think where he nailed it like fifty meters on the fly like it was he absolutely smoked it it just went a little bit wide but Japers like that's it's one of those things where that that's not a natural part of the game like you when you're trying to develop players there's a lot of like it's it's catch and pass and it's running and it's tackling and it's like sort of the the actions that are um that just naturally occur over and over during the during the course of a rugby league game like these are the skills you're trying to develop and guys the kicking is almost like this little side thing but it's so important like it's just it's it's really like crucial to have someone who can be that kind of guy and the Warriors don't have that at the moment, but a lot of teams don't have that at the moment. Um, I do think it needs to be studied, though, how just how many close, like, get get the scientists and get the, um, I don't know, the experts to, to come crunch some numbers, just how often the Warriors have lost close games this year. Like, the amount of defeats that have been within single, like, it's a lot of them within two points, which is just one kick. 
there's also a lot of them even more within just a single try would change the um change the entire outcome of a game and they just always seem to be on the wrong side of that so yeah that's that's definitive losers stuff like that's not saying losers as an insult that's saying losers as a habit what sport did Jermaine Isaka play a lot of in Christchurch? Uh, is he a rugby union dude? Yeah, he is. He's from First Fifteen what Rugby. Do you know? So it's uh, that's the skill set. Just want to quickly dive into an Aotearoa Kiwis squad mixer. I think. If you take the squad that or the team that beat Australia last year, like everything's fairly similar. Keanu Kenny was in that squad, so he's competing with Sean Nickel Clockstar for the starting fullback position. I think Will Warbrick can come in as cover on the wing. We got Jermaine Saka, Ronaldo Molitalo, and Will Warbrick. I think you're going to see Xavier Willison, maybe even Aaron Clark as uh, forwards, depending on who's available. Similar with the Warriors, similar with what I'm going to talk about with the Black Caps. Xavier Willison's awesome. He's having a good season. I love him as a talent. Leo Thompson and Griffin Neem have already played for the Kiwis. Now, Fahu White was already in the Kiwis squad. He was 18th man when the Kiwis beat Australia. So there's a lot of depth and depth where they've already done it. The youngsters, but they've already done it. So I want Xavier Willison in the squad. But he's not necessarily a top 17 Aotearoa Kiwis player right now. Um, we have... The Warriors, I can only really put in Shans Nikol Klokstar, Marata Neokori, maybe Roger Tuivasa Sheik, and this is where things get interesting. Roger Tuivasa Sheik, I think at this stage of his career, he might opt for Samoa representation. Joey Manu, well, he's a certified starter. But he might go to Japanese rugby before the Kiwis play. Matthew Tomoko's locked in on one centre spot. So then we're dealing in maybe Joey Manu, maybe Roger Tuivasashek, maybe Dean Mariner, but he's also eligible for Samoa. Maybe Jack Howarth. And this is where things get really interesting. And I was tracking this last year when Jack Howarth Benjamin Takura and Trey Mooney got selected for New Zealand A. All of them played under 19 origin footy. All of them, to the best of my knowledge, are born and raised in Australia. And all of them played for New Zealand A. Trey Mooney, he might sneak into the mix as a middle forward. Um, Benjamin Takura and Jack Howarth have really hearty connections to Queensland Rugby League though. Benjamin Takura is not necessary he's not a consistent NRL player right now, so he's not going to be in the Kiwis mix. Jack Howarth, what's he doing right now? He's playing center for the Melbourne Storm. So this is one of the most interesting representative pockets in rugby league right now. The Kiwis might need a centre, and Jack Howarth played for New Zealand Day last year. Now he's playing centre at a quite a high level for the Melbourne Storm. But he's been a Queensland prodigy basically his whole life. So I want to introduce this storyline, this perspective to the rugby league discourse. Because like Jack Howarth, there's a, depending on Roger Tuivasashek, Joey Manu, and Dean Mariner, like you could make a case that Jack Howarth is playing better footy right now as a centre. But like Dean Mariner, Tuivasashek, and Joey Manu, or not Joey Manu, but Tuivasashek and Dean Mariner, Jack Howarth has uh, some curious eligibility stuff going on. If he chooses Kiwi's... This year, that would come after him, Benjamin Takura, and Trey Mooney all lined up for New Zealand A, and that would mean he's choosing Aotearoa Kiwis over State of Origin and Australia. And that would be quite an interesting 
juncture for rugby league because whether it was Tony Carroll, whether it's Caelan Ponga, anyone else you want to throw into that conversation, everyone assumes, oh, state of origin. If you've got the choice between state of origin and Kiwis, you're going to play state of origin. And that might be the direction Jack Howarth goes in. But it's something to watch out for. Because centre is the most interesting spot in a Kiwi squad. And Jack Howarth, along with the other two, went out of his way to play for New Zealand Day last year. Something to watch out for. We had the Black Cap squad. We got a Black Cap squad to play in India against Afghanistan and to play in Sri Lanka. The two tests against Sri Lanka are World Test Championship tests. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the squad is reasonably as expected. I think they've selected Michael Bracewell ahead of East Sodi, which is I'd put that down to spin bowling all rounder ahead of certified spinner. So whatever your opinion is i don't think it makes a massive difference to like the first 11 makeup of the team i don't know off the top of my head ishodi was really good in pakistan and then wasn't so good in his one test against bangladesh last year so that might have been where the black caps decided to go in a different direction uh the batting is Basically the same batting unit as usual. I was I don't I don't really want to react to like the headlines, but the headlines about the squad were oh my god Tim Southey might not be the captain. And this I was like yeah no shit like he's a seam bowling captain and they're playing three tests as well as three more tests in India later on. Like, is Tim Southey realistically going to play all three tests of this first league? No. So it's not really surprising that he might step down as captain for the one test. Like, I just... I don't really see the drama. I don't see, like, oh my god, Tim Southey might step aside as captain for a test. Yeah, they're playing in India and Sri Lanka, and he is a... Seema, who swings the ball at 126 kilometers an hour. That's not a recipe. It would be more crazy if Tim Southey played all three tests just because he was captain. That would be more crazy than him not playing and not being captain. Another little thing here, though, is there is no... Like, this team, I believe, is more captaincy by committee. The Black Caps don't have a Ben Stokes leader. The Black Caps had a Ben Stokes leader when they had Brendan McCullum as the captain because his leadership and his mana was like, follow me. I am impacting you as humans and you are going to rally behind me for the nation, maybe. Like, uh, I don't know what other kind of captains fit into this mold in cricket. Maybe Pat Cummins is this type of leader. But even then, I don't think Pat Cummins has a dramatic influence over the style of cricket the team plays. Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum as captains influence the style of cricket and the way their teams play cricket. No one in this Black Caps group does that, and that's all right. Like Kane Williamson. He's not necessarily a follow-me leader. He's just the best player. Tim Southey, he's not a follow me leader. He's just the most experienced player who wants the job. Because Kane Williamson didn't want the job, so he gave it to the next in line. And the next in line after Tim Southey is Tom Latham. So I don't really think the captaincy matters too much with this group. We can discuss the benefits, the pros and cons of the type of leaders, the type of captains you might want in cricket. 
but there's no one in New Zealand cricket right now, aside from like a Neil Wagner type, who can have that influence as captain. And if Neil Wagner was captain, uh, this for some reason this just popped into my head. <laughs> it seems crazy, but if Neil Wagner was captain, it's relevant because if Neil Wagner was captain, he'd be like, "Yo, lads, let's go, fire up. We're playing cricket this way, and we're gonna, you know, rah rah rah, follow me type of leader, like a Fisher Harris type of leadership, where his mana is just." oozing out of him and people want to rally behind him if neil wagner was captain he wouldn't play every test of this tour so i'm not too worried about the captaincy stuff if tim sally's not captain tom latham will be captain and the former captain kane williamson's going to be there so it's like i'm not too worried about the whole captaincy stuff and again, I'll reaffirm, it would be crazier for Tim Southey to play all three tests just because he's captain. Like his, this gets into the skill sets offered by Willow Rourke and Ben Sears. What do they do? They steam in, they hit the deck, and they're trying to bowl 140 kilometers per hour. Captain and, Neil Wagner would love them. <laughs> yeah, I'm not... Neil Wagner bowling, he's he's steaming in and bowling 130 Ks per hour. Um, but those two dudes, they can be more useful in these conditions than Tim Southey. Because Tim Southey, he's absolutely dominating the 100, by the way. He's uh, seven games, 28 overs, 13 wickets at an average of 11.8, 6.6 RPO. He's playing for the Birmingham Phoenix men, who are the good Birmingham Phoenix team. So shout out Tim Sally. He's doing good stuff in the hundred. But the yeah, the idea here is that Willow Rourke and Ben Sears, I think they've got more to offer as seen bowlers in these conditions. Just because they're they got a better height. They're crazy. They're skillful. Uh, and then you've got the spinners, AJ Patel, Santner, Phillips, uh, Michael Bracewell, Rachin Ravindra. You basically got two, you got room for two spin bowling all rounders, which are Phillips and Ravindra. Then you've got two frontliners, AJ Patel, Mitchell, Santner. And I think Michael Bracewell is the cover. I don't think Michael Bracewell is the first 11 lap in this tour. I think they're going to. No, I don't want to say that because Afghanistan might win. The top six batters, or I've actually got five. I wrote top six, but I got five. Tom Latham, Devin Conway, Kane Williamson, Rachin Ravindra, and Dale Mitchell. That leaves Will Young as batting cover. And then we got Tom Blundell as the wicket keeper. Tom Blundell, Devin Conway, not in form at all. So it's going to be a big uh, phase for them. But that's the squad. Do you want to bounce off anything I said, or you got any other ideas for yourself about the Black Caps test squad for one test in India against Afghanistan, and then two tests, part of the World Test Championship in Sri Lanka? Well, Glenn Phillips would be your number six, right? Because then he's also a bowling option. Blundell can therefore bat at seven, and you can pick four straight-up bowlers, probably Sandner and Patel and yep. Saldi, Henry, O'Rourke says some combination thereof, um, something along those lines. Who would be the backup wicketkeeper here? Probably Conway, I would imagine. Yeah, they like... get a bit awkward if you want to drop both of them. If you want to drop uh, Blundell and Conway for form in the like, which, which, uh, Sri Lanka series, which batter who averages twelve are we going to drop? <laughs> but I the white ferns conundrum. Yeah, I think. Except the answer there is neither. I think they would go Devin Conway. Tom Latham can be a wicket keeper. Obviously, we're moving away right. from Glenn Phillips as wicket keeper because now he's one of our best spinners. So I, there's there's options here. Yeah, I was looking at, I haven't got it in front of me, so I've got to work off memory here. But I was looking off the best bowling figures by Kiwi spinners in the last like 10 years. And 
Uh, as an indication, the second best innings figures was from Mark Craig about exact, almost exactly 10 years ago. So that's kind of tells you the spinners haven't been doing a whole lot um, in recent times. AJ Patel is the one dude who's been able, obviously he has the best figures of anyone in that time because we all remember a certain tenfer the last time we went to India. He's got a couple other good ones above sort of four for ish. And Glenn Phillips has a four for and a five for one, oh, one in Bangladesh. I think he got four wickets in, a, in an innings in Bangladesh. And he had a, the, the five baggy in, um, against Australia back, back home recently. So he actually just has better spin bowling figures than the spin bowlers. Like Mitchell Satin has still never taken a four wicket haul in a test match. His best innings figures are three for 30 odd something, which is a little bit nuts that he's. That he's worked his way back into probably being a frontline player for this with those figures, but also that it kind of feels logical at the same time. Like it, it kind of feels normal that he has worked. Like it feels like he actually has earned this opportunity. But yeah, with the opportunity, hopefully will come some wickets because he's going to do that at some point. Um, what you see from that though is Ravinger isn't necessarily someone who's going to get big overs. Um, and nor would he be if Santner's in the team and Patel's probably in the team as you're not going to bowl your third choice left arm. Uh, orthodox you've got two better options that you can rotate uh, Phillips and I think this is also why, another reason why Bracewell's in there is because he is an off spinner so that's something that counts in his favor ahead of someone like Sodi is that he does turn the ball the other direction to the two other frontline um, spinners which I do think is harsh on Sodi because he he was awesome when they went to Pakistan he took like 13 14 wickets or something like that in a two-match series and then had one bad test match, which wasn't even that bad because he still took three wickets overall. I think he got like yeah, three for 140 or something match figures, something along those lines. I think he did go for some runs, though. I think the RPO wasn't great in one of them, which is probably another thing to count against him. But yeah, uh, it's, it's I, I don't necessarily agree with that choice, but I understand it. So I can't argue with it. You know, I can I can. Point, I can like lay out why I think Sodi would be more fitting ahead of Bracewell, but also I understand it's not just a, like a head in the sand decision. There is a tactical, there are tactical reasons why the Black Caps have gone that way. So that's the, that's what their job is to do is to make them decisions uh, one way or another. Um, yeah, I will. The, the other thing, um, the one other thing I was going to present is that I remembered Tim Southey actually doing quite well. I think he got a five for in the first test against India when we went there last time. And I remember thinking he actually, I remember then looking it up and being like, yeah, he's actually got quite a good record in India. His his uh, record in India is five matches played, 20 wickets, average of 28.7, economy under threes as well. So pretty handy. Like that's actually only just better than his average in New Zealand, which is 28.12. Only just worse. I mean, the New Zealand one is only just better. Same economy, strike rate is one ball worse in India than what it is in New Zealand. Obviously, way more test matches in New Zealand. Way more wickets. But also in Sri Lanka, he has played four test matches and, to, four test matches and taken 19 wickets at 15.47, which is his best of any nation that he's played in. Hold on, hold on, hold like, on. Don't even need disclaimers. So, so Tim Southey in India averages twenty eight. Yeah. Trent Bolt in India averages thirty eight. Interesting. What was Tim Southey in Sri Lanka? Fifteen point four seven. Trent Bolt in Sri Lanka averages eighteen. Go down to Asia. What's the what's uh, Tim Southey in Asia? Tim Southey in Asia. We have seventeen matches overall, fifty-eight wickets, twenty-six point five zero average. Trent Bolt in Asia averages thirty-one point seven. All hail Tim Southey, who won't play every test on this tour, and, and nor should he, because yeah, it's. Yeah. It, 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 not only would it be crazy, it would be stupid because three test matches here, three test matches straight after, not straight after, but soon after in India, where we've just said he's got one of the better records of Kiwi bowlers, so you actually do want him ideally playing at least two, if not all three of those matches. 
and then before the year is out, there's three there's three matches at home against England as well. So there's nine test matches between now and the end of the year. You're going to ask, a, what is he, 34, 35-year-old seam bowler to play all of them? Because that's beyond crazy. That's reckless. Especially when you've got Willow Rock and Ben Sears as part of the best New Zealand seam bowling depth I've ever seen. Like Willow Rock bowls 140 Ks, smashes people on the gloves, nibbles the ball both ways. Ben Sears just straight up hectic. Like with and our actual best seamer over the last two years has been Matt Henry. Although I have, uh, I might look this up um, as I hand it over because I suspect Matt Henry's figures in Asia are probably quite terrible. Yeah, but that's like for these tests because I think Willow Rock and Ben Sears can be effective in Sri Lanka. I if if you bowl fast, you're effective anywhere. Yeah, but they're not necessarily fast bowlers, but they just. They've got energy, and that's what you need. You just need dudes who are going to keep steaming in and having a crack. And it's going to be a good position for them to get experience in these conditions. And, of course, we've got Kyle Jamison. Ben Lister, Lister's a good lefty. Nathan Smith is brewing. Zach Folks is brewing. Henry Shipley might return to domestic cricket this summer. Like, There's a lot of good seamers in New Zealand, and I believe... Aside from Tim Southey's experience and pretty good record in these conditions, they just need energy in their seam attack. They need a bit of fizz on the ball, and I'm not sure Tim Southey's off offering that offering that right now. And you've also got Matt Henry, who we've maybe suggested might not be as good in these conditions historically, but he's in career, in a career best form zone. So between those four seamers, I think they're pretty well sorted for three tests. Like you're not going to select the same seam attack across each test. There's going to be different combinations with the spinners, but I think they've got the uh, the bases covered there. Yeah, Matt Henry's played three tests in Asia, has eight wickets at 47.62. So that's... Not good. And that does include some semi-recent ones because he did go to Pakistan. He played one match in Pakistan in 2023, uh, two matches in India in 2016. So, you know, the, the two in India don't count too much. That was a long time ago, and he's a clearly far superior bowler now. Uh, the Pakistan one, he took two wickets in that one match at 63.5, one in each innings. So that's not amazing. But as you say, like, he is a better bowler than what he's been when he's been to some of these, like, certainly than when he went to India last, and has emerged as a leader in this team. But then also, like, there is a thing to consider if you've taken two seamers into, you might, you might be room for a third, You can because you've got the spin bowling all-rounders, you might not have to pick Patel and Santner if you think there might be a little bit in the deck or whatever for the, for the, um, for the seam bowlers, but if you are only taking two seamers and Salvi and Henry are your two guys, I think that is to your point about you need a bit more fizz than that potentially, but at least need someone who can bowl a bouncer now and then, which <laughs> if the ball isn't moving sideways, at least get it to move upwards, you know? Right. We also have uh, domestic cricket contracts coming through for women. So this is the first round. There wasn't too much movement. But I do want to touch on a few. There were two players who moved. One was like an unofficial move. And for some reason, Northern Districts love these unofficial moves. Well, they love having non-contracted players in their setup. Because the men's stuff, the Northern Districts announcement specifically mentioned Tim Seifert, Scott Kugeline, Joe Walker, who don't have contracts, but they can still play. And then the women's stuff, they mentioned... In other player news, all-rounder Sky Bowden, who has previously played for Auckland Hearts, will be joining Northern Districts, but will not be domestically contracted. Bit weird she's not contracted, but this tells us about the contracts. Who cares about the contracts? Because you can still play. The thing here is that Sky Bowden is moving from Auckland to Northern Districts. Sky Bowden is a really good cricketer. The other movement that I've noticed is Anna Browning moving from Auckland to Otago. 
So somehow Auckland, well, Rob O'Donnell, their captain, left Auckland to go to Northern Districts, which is kind of alarming. But you've, then you've got two youngsters, two really good young cricketers from Auckland who have moved, Anna Browning and Sky Bowden. Anna Browning has like this, she hasn't done a whole lot. She's, I think she's 19 years old. Um, but she's T20 bowling. She's averaging 29.87, which is pretty good compared to White Ferns bowlers. Um, and she's building in her career. She's only played 12 games. She bats a bit. She bowls a bit. She's a good cricketer. And I am curious to see how she develops in the Otago Spark system because they have a great development system for women's cricket under Craig Cumming. Uh, last year, Anna Browning did take five wickets and an average of 30 in the Super Smash. So that's pretty good. She didn't play a whole lot in... Well, she played a bit of HBJ Shield, three wickets and an average of 46. So I'm curious to see how she develops. Sky Bowden was Auckland's best Super Smash, let's say, bowler. Five games, 10 wickets, average of 12, 7.6 RPO. Molly Penfold, what did she do? Five wickets and an average of 31. Sky Bowden averaged 12, Molly Penfold averaged 31. Sky Bowden has a T20 bowling average of 17. In her career, Molly Penfold averages 27, Rosemary Mayer averages 22.7. That is to say, Sky Bowden is pretty damn good at cricket. Specifically T20 cricket, but I believe she's just a really good young cricketer in Aotearoa. Now she's moving to Northern Districts. Where I... Hope she plays a lot. Like Sky Bowden, Marama Downs, Kaylee Knight. That is an excellent seam attack. You've also got uh, Jesse Prasad, Shreya Naidu also offer seam bowling. That is a really good seam bowling unit. Hopefully the non-contracted status doesn't mean Sky Bowden's not going to play a lot of cricket. I hope she does play a lot of cricket. because she, she is genuinely one of the best youngsters in New Zealand cricket. Heading into this summer. Um, but either way, two good cricketers from Auckland have left. Anna Browning's gone to Otago. Sky Bowden's gone to Northern Districts without a contract. And that's the only movement. I'll dive deeper into all these contract lists for a yarn on our website, but that's just what I'm thinking about um, fresh off the announcements yesterday. We also had... Wait, you, you're right. Well, I was going to say is Browning going for a 19-year-old moving from Auckland to Otago sounds like probably a uni bounce, right? Although I guess there's no way of knowing that if they don't tell us. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's just more cricket related. Well, it is definitely cricket related. Yeah, or, or else she'd probably it, already it, be there. At some point. She would have uh, already been... Like She's come up through the Auckland system. She was playing for Auckland last summer. Now she's mm. going to be playing for Otago. So I get what you're saying about the uni thing because there are a lot of, like we've seen Canterbury players given scholarships and stuff like that. But in the bigger picture with players who are leaving Auckland, it's just an interesting thing that's happening there. Because Anna Browning and Sky Bowden are two young players who played a lot of first 11 cricket as 19, 20-year-olds last year. Uh, Sky Bowden's like 22, maybe. So, just something interesting to watch out for. And I think they are two players who can get better outside of Auckland. Football. We got the Flying Kiwis. We had a funky assist from Liberato Kakache. Whipping the left ball. Whipping his left boot. Chanel Harris Tavita Styles around the goalpost. He whipped it around the defense uh, for a great assist. What's uh, 
where are we at with flying kiwis i don't see as much like transfer news we just got some cool highlights some some kiwi footballers doing cool stuff so what do you what do you reckon a little bit of transfer stuff but not a lot i think i was you know um probably a bit much to expect straight after the olympics a bunch of players just announcing within days because obviously clubs would rather them be there in a person in attendance do the medicals but also do like the promos um couple interviews for the for the team channels and all that kind of stuff pose with a scarf and and whatnot so we have had india page riley's move confirmed over with uh crystal palace which is a sneaky one not so much for her but because i've been waiting for ria percival to re-sign with with palace on a permanent basis for ages and it still hasn't happened and they've actually gone to utah now they're having a preseason camp borrowing the utah royals sort of like ho well hosted by the utah royals who apparently have just really good facilities with a friendly game at the end of it, which might mean India Page Riley versus Macy Fraser, but I suspect probably not. I think Fraser's ankle might um, uh, might prohibit that from from being the case, but we'll see. Because they did hint that maybe it wasn't as bad of an injury as it as it was well, certainly not as bad as it looked in the moment when she, um, you know, uh, the physio had to help her off the field in tears at the at the Olympics, but. They did then say maybe she was an outside chance of featuring in the last Ferns game, which she didn't, but at least that tells us it's not going to be like a six-month injury or anything. Um, the end of Ursel gets back into action in a couple weeks. They're on a bit of a break at the moment, which is why there's room for a friendly against Crystal Palace. So that's pretty cool. Um, but if they're, uh, like, if they're already going on preseason tour, surely you would have announced Rhea Percival by now. So I'm starting to think maybe that won't happen. Um, but yeah we'll see we'll see how it goes also ava collins did sign with colding in denmark so another kiwi footballer making a big step to denmark and the professional stakes she has just finished university at um i think st john's uni which i think is new yorkish so she's now done that she actually had one of the better uni careers that we've seen from um a lot of kiwi players who have been through there recently ava collins did so good from her she went straight into colding's team for the first game of the season and played 90 minutes which was great because none of our other um, danish players played in the women's competition this week because i think a lot of them were coming back from olympics Steinmetz obviously coming back from olympics daisy cleverly has been released but ellie green was coming back from olympics uh she and Steinmetz i don't think played um Claudia Bunge was in the squad but didn't play. She was on the bench, so it was just Ava Collins. But she got 90 minutes in her professional debut, so that's awesome. But not a lot of transfer stuff other than that. And there are some big names still on the board. You know, there's like um, Sapreet Singh. We don't know where he's going. Grace uh, Jolly is another one. Jackie Hand is another one. Like, there's a few. Hannah Wilkinson's another one. Um, there's, there's some significant names that we're still waiting to hear from where they might end up. Um, other than that, yeah, I think well, I tell you what, Lippi Kakache might apply to both of these things because we're getting a few seasons starting. We've got some interesting stuff going on. Max Crocom being benched for game one of the season as the reigning player of the year for Burton Albion was definitely a strange one. It's not like they even signed a superstar goalie to replace him. It's not some hotshot prospect on loan from Man City or anything. It's just a guy they bought from Charlton for who was in the same division as them. So really strange. It seems to be the case there is they just want Crocom to play with his feet more, and he's not Alex Paulson as far as that goes. Although, I can just sign Alex Paulson, man. Like, <laughs> why don't they just get Paulson on loan? League One would have been fine. I think that would have actually been a more progressive um, step for him than just going back to the A-League where he's already the goalkeeper of the year. Now he's going to try win goalkeeper of the year again with a different club, which... It'd hey, be amazing if he did that, but I don't know if it's quite progressing him as much. Um, does add some nice spice to that Phoenix versus Auckland uh, derby, though, which is going to be pretty cool. Um, but Kakache has had transfer rumors about him all season. He is into the last year of his contract now, uh, all, all, all off season, I should say. He was rumored to a couple clubs in Germany. He was rumored to a couple clubs um, in the second tier in Italy, but also another club in the top tier of Italy. I'm sure there were other clubs that are interested that just haven't got their name mentioned in anything. I counted at least what five teams I think that have um, supposed like that have just been reported as being interested, and in let, let like let alone what stuff hasn't been reported. 
hadn't signed a new contract yet. The left back who starts ahead of him, Giuseppe Pizzella, he has signed a new contract, which is not a great sign for Kakacha. It's clear that they are prepared to sell him if a good enough bid comes in. But what we saw for their first game of the season, which was a cup game, first round of the Coppa Italia, and they played Catanzaro, who I think are a team from the division below, so a game they were expected to win. Pizzella starts at left wing back. As expected. But Kakachi is not on the bench this time. The last year, it was all about swapping back and forth between those guys. And Pizzella had a few injuries, which meant Kakachi ended up playing about twice as many minutes as him. And just quietly, Empoli were way more efficient when Kakachi was on the field versus when Pizzella was on the field. Pizzella didn't... I, I can only imagine it's the attacking output that holds Kakachi back. Yeah, Kakache had one assist last season. No goals and one assist. Not great. Like You can see why they would think that could be something they could be improved upon, except that Pizzella had zero goals and zero assists. So I, I don't really know why one dude is favored that much higher, but they found an interesting solution with the new manager in, in this game where Kakache played as the left-sided center back in a back three and was awesome. He was fantastic. He set up a... <laughs> the irony is that they moved him deeper into the lineup and he got an assist that way where he wasn't getting enough assists playing higher up the field. He actually could have had two. He had another... Uh, one of their other goals, he played a very similar ball in behind where the defender kind of did cut it out, but he didn't cut it out cleanly and then the striker just swept through and took it anyway and scored regardless, lifted it over the keeper, which was nice. So he had one assist and one goal where he didn't get the assist, but he basically set up the goal as well. Like it was his pass that created the move. A lot of good distribution stuff, a lot of good just like stronger position. This is not the toughest task by any means that he will be up against if he does get to play that role consistently. But, you know, one of the main reasons I was quite keen on seeing him leave Empoli once these transfer rumors started creeping up is that I just don't want to see one of the always two or three very best players, certainly of his age range. It's just like him and Marco Staminich probably of that age range. Don't want to see him stuck on the bench, not playing when there's a possibility of the other wise being the case. I, and if this is the solution where he just plays a lot more as a center back, I actually kind of like that. I think that in a way plays into the strength. It's not the role we'll see him playing for the all whites. He's going to continue to be their left back for a long time to come. But I think he's quite well suited in Serie A for this particular team as well to, to a role like that. If that is indeed what's coming, it might just have been a plug the gap until a new signing gets announced because they did sell their, their best center back in the offseason. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But I'm suddenly extremely curious about this Kikache Empoli situation because if he does stay, you got to give him a new contract because otherwise he's going to just leave for a free, con a free transfer at the end of the year. And you get nothing for a dude you spend a couple million on in the first place. So there's, uh, there's a few different factors going on at play there with Kakache, but could not have started the season better than with a commanding centre-back performance with a lovely assist and then a couple other good chances created as well. What's your, what's your latest feelings on the Alex Paulson situation, aside from it being a step down in his development and the well, impending excitement of the rivalry? Well, that's all there is for me. I don't. If they change the the rule to allow that to happen, then they've changed the rule. That's fine. Like it's just, it, I I don't really have an opinion on that. I don't. I don't think it's some traitorous decision from him or anything like that. Um, I yeah. I just think it's a little bit of a shame that I. It's it's a little bit of a shame that the Phoenix sold their three best prospects. Alex Paulson goes to a Premier League club. That's the big money move. That's the most expensive of them. Uh, ben Old goes to a club that's just been promoted to the French top league. That's the second best. Ben Sermon goes to an MLS club. That's the third most expensive of the three transfers. And somehow we're going to end up in a situation where like Ben Old looks like he's going to be a week one starter. If you're reading the tea leaves from preseason, He's already got an assist for them in one of their friendly games. He just scored a goal in another one of their friendly games. He started every game he's been available for since returning from the uh, ankle injury, except for one where they named a bunch of kids and like a sort of youth team thing. And he still played 20 odd minutes off the bench there. Finn Sermon has already popped up on the bench once for Portland Timbers at the first opportunity in a League's Cup game. Somehow Paulson is going to end up in the lowest situation of those three for the next season. Beauty. That is the niche cast. 
We'll do an extra podcast for the Patreon Fano and those with a paid Substack subscription on Thursday, so tap in if you wanna. Otherwise, big up yourself, love yourself. Kia kaha, stay beautiful, church.